the Million Dollar Mortgage Experience Podcast. All right, welcome to the podcast. Today we have a very special guest with us, Todd Duncan. He's the founder and CEO of the Todd Duncan Group, the most sought after coaching, training, and events company for top mortgage and sales professionals. Todd began his career as a loan originator, financing over 5,000 transactions in 12 years. Now he teaches the power of high trust and how to win clients for life. Written over 17 books, New York Times bestseller, and uh, now is a well sought after game changing speaker. So glad to have you on. You Thanks are amazing. <laughs> good to be here. Thank you for having me down. Yeah. It's good to reconnect again. Yeah. Changing we, world, huh? It is. And you came down, I think, for a, the Mortgage Minute, like maybe in 2018. I think like so. Yeah. 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 Same circumstances. I, I was on my way down here to have another meeting and we put something together at the last minute. And you here we are today. And we've been talking for, uh, I think, a couple months. And, and it was just like yesterday, it was like fun loans. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, million dollar mortgage. Experience. I've been there. Yeah, and then I pull in, and you guys are doing good. It's beautiful. You. Yeah, yeah I'm excited to be part of this. We're growing and just you know trying to shift and pivot with the market changing. I mean, today was a nutty day in the market. Right? With the rate, you know, they're all saying, <laughs> "I guess we didn't do enough." You know, rate hikes. Uh, so like, gosh, okay, that just means more misery for you know the rates going up and trying to tame the inflation, right? And yeah. less loans. There's already less loans. You know, but you know, somebody told me when I was brand new in the business because I say your listeners may not know this, but when I started, I mean, interest rates were nineteen yeah, percent, right? It was high. like we were in the tank, you know, and short of the Great Depression, it was like one of the worst economies ever. But if you take a two hundred year run of interest rates in America, the average has been about seven and a half percent. Yeah, you know, on a average. Yeah, yeah. so you know, the highs come and the lows come, and um, I always tell people, John, it's not the market; it's what you do in the market. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really what you do in whatever market you're in and any market you can win in. Yeah. Yeah. I got in. It was like, I think I was selling six points, 10 and a half rate. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, I, so when I hear people, you know, complain about the rates now, I'm like, you have no idea. Zero. I mean, you said 19. I mean, Jesus, that would be. I haven't closed a loan in my career 12 years. I didn't close a loan less than 10%. Wow. Never. Yeah. I mean, cause, cause that's what it was. That's what everyone knew. Right? Right. It was like no different. Okay, let's do it. And people borrow at 10%, right? I mean, and, all I mean, day long. If, so we go, we, I love Mexico, go down to, yeah. you know, on vacation yeah. and stuff like that. And the rates, there are like 12, 14% oh and they're borrowing, you know, they're right. borrowing less. I mean, they're like, I don't think they'd borrow the higher LTVs like we do, but right. they'll, right. they'll borrow. And, you know, so like yeah. people borrow, it's just a matter of, like you said, finding the, the opportunity, finding where that person is that, that wants to borrow. Versus like the low hanging fruit that everyone's had. Well, and we we lost um, we, we lost a lot of. Um, let me back up. Many of us did not have a skill set before. You know the low interest rates of 2020, 21, 22. Um, we were out there and we were doing a good job, and then we get blessed by these low rates, right? And yep. and then the ones that had skill sets still got blessed, lots of volume, but their yep. skills got a little bit weak too. And I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago and she said, what do I do to just get back at it fast? And I go, you know, art of war, right? Don't mm -hmm. let anybody know you're coming and just come and come hard. She goes, what does that look like? And I said, why don't you just do an event? I mean, you're, you're yeah. top in your market. Why don't you do an event? And uh, why don't you just speak for four hours and talk about how to win in today's market? And she goes, that's a great idea. And so I followed up with her. She had 125 real estate agents show up and in the next two weeks, took 17 applications. That's huge. So business is yeah. out there. You just got to, you got to approach it differently, right? If you used to be narrow and, you know, a few clients, maybe right now you go a little bit wider, but it's still about the relationship and it's still about what value are you adding? And um, I'm, I'm here to tell you, people are winning today. They're yeah. winning in today's market. It's up here first yep. and then it's uh, the skill set piece, so... Yeah, you're just not going to have everyone winning, right? But that's, that's the old man. But that's a choice. Yeah. You want to win? Choose to win. Right. You want to lose? You're choosing to lose by default because you've chosen not to win. Yeah. And, and winning's <laughs> never been easy, right? Like, when has ever being a, a win ever been super easy, to, or at least to get to the place where you can win, right? It's just, it's not, it's simple, but because you have to follow just a few steps, but it's not easy. Like, you got to put work in, right? Yeah. I think, I think I tell people right now that, you know, you, you look at four things. You look at competence, right? So, so if you have the right attitude and you marry it up with the right skill, when you're yeah. competent with that skill, then you have confidence. And yeah. then when you have confidence, you can be consistent. Yeah. But if you're not competent, you're going to be like this. And if you're not confident, confident you're yeah. not going to be confident. And if you're not confident, you're not going to be consistent. And so we waste all this time. Yeah. And so I, I'm over training people right now. Our coaching company is over training on like just a few disciplines. Like 
the sales conversation, you know, the, the, the weekly uh, partner follow-up, you know, what does that look like? Because people are just, they're not following up. They stink at it. Yeah. So lots of stuff what we can talk think, about. Kat, I, th I think that <clears throat> that probably was part of the last couple of years. I, th like, I feel like so many people just sort of like, they lob a little like call out to someone, but then they don't have that same follow-up skills that, as like, you know, when we've been in the business a long time, I think you were a little bit longer than me, but you know, I learned and, and was trained and coached into following up like relentlessly. Mm. That was how you got business. Right. How you won. I think with the last few years, people didn't have to do follow up. They would just be like, who wants to lower their rates? And then, you know, whoever responded, they did those loans. And then the ones that trickled down, if they would have followed up, they could have gotten a higher percentage of those. But many of those people just, you know, they didn't follow up with them. So it's always the name of the game. You know that. I mean, it's like he who follows up the best wins. And one of our one of our business kind of models is if you don't follow up with them, they won't follow through with you. Yeah. And it's just a simple, it's a simple idea. And there's two things about that that I think are important to the listener. One is it's your professional responsibility to follow up. Right. You know, um, if you really think about it, if you don't follow up with somebody's most important financial decision of their life, arguably – Mm -hmm. then why should you win the business, right? True. And then and then it's like a big excuse factory of why I don't have time to follow up when in fact, if you followed up, you would not only have the money, but you would have the time and then you could even do a better job following up. And um, right. we had a client just uh, last year saw this coming and she hired a, she calls this person her chief financial officer, but changes the F, chief follow-up officer. Mm. And mm -hmm. she hired a CFO. And now this person is dialing all day long, making sure they're staying in touch with the clients. Now, because everybody has low rates, they're doing efficiency checkups. You know, they're, they're not doing like uh, annual reviews per se, but they're, yeah. how's the mortgage working for you? Any changes in your financials? Any changes in your dreams and goals about where you want to go? You know, what's next, yeah. you know, for you? Right, and, right. and they're do you having- have any, uh, do, you, do you need to tap into your equity? Right. Do you need, do you need a HELOC? Do you need a second? Right. Because because someone's going to ask them that they're going to deposit their check at Bank of America. You know they're going to someone's going to ask them that question, and then you just lost them as a customer. Hundred right? percent, yeah. hundred percent, yeah. So it's I think that you if you choose if you choose to succeed in this market, you back it with skills. Yeah, it's just, I mean I don't know. It's just there's a lot of excuses right now. There's it's so a many. weird market, but there's a lot of excuses. It's and they're easy all to be to be making excuses. I think versus right? like choosing to have that mentality yeah. of like i gotta get up and work i gotta make it happen yeah i mean you 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 got in the mortgage business a while back like you said like 19 percent. it was probably freaking hard back then to do loans but you chose you you trained you tell us a little bit about like how you got in the business and kind of what your path was and how you got to where you are today yeah so i i um you know like many i graduated from college i had a degree in finance and uh and marketing and business and i i really didn't have an idea of what i wanted to do my Little League coach happened to be the owner of a big real estate company, and my mom and dad were friends of he, he and his wife. And so we had a, a barbecue, I think it was the, the August after I graduated, and, uh, and he said, so what are you going to do? And I said, I'm not sure yet. And he goes, have you ever thought about real estate? And I said, I said, yeah, I have. And he said, have you ever thought about mortgages? And I said, yeah, I have. And he said, I have both. So, I mean, I've known you since you were seven, mm -hmm. you know, do you want to come to work for us and you can either be on the real estate side or the, the lending side. And so I interviewed a couple different uh, managers and I kind of decided that I, I liked the finance side. I liked the mortgage side. And I had a built in 26 office kind of milk route, right? From mm -hmm. San Clemente, California up to Anaheim, California. And so uh, I was the in-house lender for, you know, Tarbell Real Estate and nice. uh, started calling on offices and there was nothing happened, no magic, nothing happened. You know, rates were 18, 19%, prime was 21. And everybody thought the sky was falling. And I, I made calls for like, I don't know, two weeks. I probably called on a thousand agents. And my expectation was I would get at least something, right? Right. And got nothing. So I went to the beach and I was thinking, <laughs> should I really be in this business? And um, so I called a friend of mine that owned a, his father owned a real estate company in um, Fullerton. So I went up there one afternoon, um, spent about three hours in that office, probably counted 20 loan officers, title reps to kind of walk through. And at the very end of the day, around four, this guy walks into the office. He's got a leather folio, beautiful suit on, comes up to the, the receptionist and says, my name is John Barnes. I have an appointment with Paula Richardson. And right then I knew, John, right then I knew that was it, right? How did he get an appointment with Paula? And I didn't know who Paula was. <laughs> she comes out, shakes his hand, they disappear. And I go to the receptionist, I go, who's Paula? <laughs> she goes, she's number one in America for Remax. Wow. Oh, 
no kidding. So this guy comes in, has an appointment with the number one agent in America. And I'm thinking, yeah. I got to figure out what he did. And so I called him the next day and we ended up sitting down together and, and he, we weren't competitors, so to speak. But like anybody who gets mentored, I think they mentor. Yeah. You know, I think they feel an obligation to mentor back when they have help and Pay somebody forward. reaches down to pull them up. They're going to do the same thing. And he told me, he said, you got to make one decision before you do anything. Hmm. And I go, what's that decision? He goes, you got to choose between relationships or transactions. Mm. And I said, what's the difference? These were ex his exact words. <laughs> he goes, transactions will make you a living. Relationships will make you a fortune. Wow. And I go, I want to make a fortune. And he goes, <laughs> relationships. And from there, the whole thing changed. It wasn't like I immediately decided I'm not calling on 26 offices. Right. And I'm not calling on 1,000 real estate agents. Yep. And I started going from shotgun to rifle. And within about four months, I had seven of the top real estate agents in Orange County. And we just crushed it. We did $27 million in loans the first year with interest rates at 18%. And my average loan amount was $71,000. Man. Crushed it. I think that alone we could just be done right there if you do if you, if you do what he just said like right there and you focus on transact i mean not transactions focus on relationships, relationship that's that's the opposite i think of what we all did over the last few years it was like like we said i think i said earlier like just drinking from a fire hose because everyone was trying to lower their rates and it was this easy money and the relationship sort of fell on the wayside mm -hmm. and you know i mean give, can you give an example of like if you were starting out from scratch right now and you had no business where would you, how would you get a, your first relationship? Like, what would you do? The, the first thing I would do is I would do anything in my power to find one borrower. I don't care where that person comes from. Like a buyer or a, a buyer? buyer. Somebody, yeah, who a buyer. Wants to, uh -huh. somebody who wants to buy a house and yep. finance that, that house or, or needs some loan to do some transaction, right? So yep. in, in residential, I would, I would do everything I could to pick a buyer, find a buyer that wants to buy. And then what I would do is I would help finance them and I would connect the dots. Like, who do they know that's in this transaction? It might be a builder, mm -hmm. might be a listing agent. You know, it could be maybe, um, you know, maybe I get their their uh, brokerage statement and I see who the financial planner is or mm -hmm. the wealth manager. You know, I talk about who, who does their insurance. I get the insurance agent. And what I would do is I would start doing that. I, I would keep it super because simple. Because you have an easy open door no matter what. 100%. Like on, on, on all their situations. Like 100%. on their, like their CPA, you have an open door. Yeah, everyone. Everything. Yeah. So there's a, there's a gal that, that last year um, closed $221 million in loans, 721 family transactions last year. In, 19, in 2013, she came to our Hytro Sales Academy. Mm -hmm. That year, she funded $7 million. Mm -hmm. So in nine years, she went from $7 million to $221 million in That's residential massive. fundings. Massive. Number one thing she did, on every loan from 2013 on, she simply reached out to the financial planner to introduce herself, see if she could share the mortgage strategy with the financial planner, make sure they were good with that, yep. and then follow up with them in a week or two to see if they could have a business development appointment. Wow. $7 million to $221 million That's huge. In nine years. And all she did was do the same thing you just asked me about. Yeah. Who's this person? Let's blow their mind. Let's take great care of them. And oh, by the way, during the transaction, we're going to pick this person, this person, and this person. Then you create relationships. A hundred percent. But then here's the fall, the, the fall down for most. And I think, I think everybody gets this. We, we will do almost anything to court somebody. That's sure. the kind of person we want to do business with. <clears throat> and then it's fascinating to see how much of that we don't do after they start doing business, right? So right. just today I had about 200 of our coaching clients on a call and they were talking about the art of the art of follow-up right and the art of partnership planning and i said to them i said if you really keep this thing simple most people when they start worrying about business go wide yeah and they try to get more and more and more people and i said the key is not to go wide the key is to to go deep mm -hmm. and people go well what does that mean i go well what deep means is you you totally understand right now that we're in the market we're in if you're in real estate, if you're in new construction, if you're in a lot of those businesses, your business is getting hurt right now. Yep. We got valuations that are coming down. We got, you know, some some geo areas still have multiple offers going on, but even that's starting to soften. We're going to have a, you know, kind of a slow ride on on, you know, appreciation over the next 2 or 3 years. But at the end of the day, people are buying and people yep. are selling. So what would happen? If you had 10 relationships, 
not 10 transactions, but 10 yeah. relationships. Right. And then each of the relationships, because every single week you had a 15 minute conversation with them, each of those relationships generated one or two or maybe three referrals. Mm -hmm. And this is where our system's different. We don't use the word leads. Yep. The reason we don't use the word leads is because leads have low conversion. Yep. We use the word referrals. Especially online leads. Well, yeah. a to a horrible, right? Yeah. But if a financial planner says to you, you are going to do a deal, and I know you're going to buy this home. You need to use this guy. He's my mm -hmm. mortgage guy. Mm -hmm. I trust him completely. Right. You're not going to, like, shop me. You're not going to say, well, I'm going to talk to three lenders. You're not going to say any of that. Right. Because somebody you trust says to you, you need to talk to this guy. Yeah. If that happened every week for every mortgage professional in America, they'd have, I don't know, somewhere between 70 and maybe 100 buyer conversations a month. And people go, well, there's not that many people in my market. That's crap. Yeah. That's crap. You know, my city, the city that I did loans in had 105,000 people in it. And I did almost 6,000 loans in 12 years. There's plenty of people. Yeah. You just have to make the connections. And so I tell people, what would happen if you have 10 and they refer you to two a week? That's 20 conversations a week. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where the math gets exciting. If just one out of four of those buyers likes me because I have a different approach, I'm a relationship guy, not a deal guy. Right. Okay. And they like me. And Three say no right now, but maybe it's timing, maybe it's credit, maybe it's this or that. But one says yes. I'm going to fund 180 loans at 90% pull through. So let's just get the 10 relationships. Yep. Let's park on them. Let's ask them questions every single week about how we can help, who they're showing property to, you know, what sellers they're talking to. Let's, let's just stay in that conversation. Yeah, stay real. And all we have to do for the rest of our life is take the one out of four to two out of four to three out of four, we go from 180 fundings to 480 fundings. And any loan officer in America can take 480 fundings and times it by what they make per loan. Yep. And we're talking millions of dollars a year. Yeah. And all it takes is 10. It just takes <laughs> 10 people willing to say, you and I are going to figure out how to find two buyers a week. Yep. That's it. That's 80, not, and that, 80, that, 80 You make it sound so simple. It and is. it is simple. It's the art and the science of doing it, though. And then it's just that work of following it up. Right. right? Just making sure that you're not just going, oh, I'm good. I'm going to go on vacation. I'm going to forget about this. It, the, and there's, I'm sure there's technologies right now that you can just simplify some of this, right? Like there's CRMs that can kind of do like automatic drips and... Right? Like, or, or do you still there, do there, this? There are, but here's the danger you zone. You don't want to get too far out of the no, 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 personal no, no. touch, I, right? So, so let's go back. Let's go back to relationships or transactions. If you have transactions, use automation to inform them what's going on. Right. If you have relationships, don't use automation. Use effective tools that still keep humanity in the game. So I'll give you an example. Like reminders for yourself, things well, like it's, that. No, it's not even that. It's like, so we know right now that last year, the number one communication tool to update borrowers on the status of their loan was email. Okay. 66% of status updates were done via email. Okay. The net promoter score is 76%. So that means you have detractors. They're mm -hmm. not, you know, they're not the nines and tens. They're not the threes or fours, but they're right. kind of like sixes and sevens, right? So then you look at, well, what's more effective than that? Text messaging, ironically, yep. has an 86% NPS. Even better, right? And it's only done 8% of the time. You mm. know what's even better? Phone call? A phone call. <laughs> and it's just shocking to see whether you feel that as a mortgage professional, you have the time or not. It is the phone call that creates the best customer experience. So it's kind of yep. like back to the future. Right. And there's a book called Marketing Rebellion written by a guy named uh, Robert Schaefer. He builds the case on the more we rely on auto marketing the less likely the consumers are to use us again. Wow. It's really scary. That really, is. really scary. So I got one guy right now um, picked picked um, four different milestones in the journey of a loan, right? So a loan submitted, appraisal in, um, docs out, recorded. Cool. Yep. So what he does every single day is figure out which loans are going to one of those four that day. He will um, call the buyer straight to voicemail, leave a message. He will call the buy side agent straight to voicemail and leave a message. And then he'll connect with the listing agent or the builder to have a conversation because mm -hmm. he knows that when the loan closes, it's going to be the listing agent and or the builder that he cross sells to continue to build. Right. So he'll make 40 minutes worth of calls a day. 
<laughs> with the highest customer SAT score. And he uses technology. So he uses Slidial. So Slidial is a technology. Download the app and you go straight to voicemail. That's smart. Yeah. That way and you don't then, have to take time to like, right. you know. And then the scal that I told you about that went to 221 million, she uses what we teach in Time Traps, which is called one timing. She'll create a video that will hit one of those four status points. But instead of sending it via email, she sends it via text. So Smart, it's still yeah. a 60 second update, right. but it's not like, hey, just wanted to let Mr. and Mrs. Maddox know that they're, it's not even that. It's right. like, hey, if you're getting this video, your loan is approved. Nice. Boom, 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 right? She'd already, yeah, she already made the, one made time, the video. One time yeah. she uses 700 times Same a year. Same one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what so that's the, how you use technology. To that's make, what the pros make your are life doing, a yeah. little easier, yeah. but you're still doing that relationship touch, which is super key. So in, in our world right now, the, the three things we're looking at is humanity still drives the mortgage decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, if people don't trust you, they're not going to use you, yep. right? So you got to have that piece. You can't lead with tech. Tech can come in right behind humanity. Right. And then touch can't be automated. Touch is touch because it's touch. Right. Okay. Or or we have, you know, either eye contact via video or mm -hmm. I make a phone call to you and I can't see you, but I can you hear, hear you. Hear the voice. Yeah. Or I FaceTime you. Right. And you pick it up. Sure. So we could we could argue right now I don't have time for that. And what I would argue is if you make the time for that, your acquisition cost, your referral cost, right. and your cost of doing business is gonna go way down. Yep. And your conversion goes up because people it's trust like you. investing in your future, right? 100%. Versus like spending your money right now and just the hot, fast, you know, quick, quick, right? Quick right. win, right? And you're right. and you're you're like, okay, I'm putting this stuff so that my future's better. My future's better. My future's better. Um, speaking of trust, you were talking about you have a book, one of your seventeen. <laughs> it's called High Trust. What what's that all about? So I, obviously we we need trust when we do we work with clients and relationships, but. Give us a quick synopsis of the high trust book. So I think I think the the impetus to write that book was the observation that people work too hard, they're too stressed, and they don't make enough money for the time they're putting in. Okay. So we started looking at a, a cut line, and the cut line I think was a quarter of a million dollars in commissions, and we wanted to interview ten thousand commission salespeople above that, mm -hmm. and ten thousand below that. Yeah. And what we found out is the people above it did 14 distinct things that the people below did not do. And so those became the 14 laws of high trust selling. And what they encapsulate is this idea of um, life mastery, business mastery, time mastery, and relationship mastery. So all 14 laws are sequential in that one builds to two, two builds to three. And by the time you're done with law 14, which is law of the encore, which is the whole customer experience, you have, a, you have a, an OS, right? An operating system. Sure. The subtitle of the book is what I like the most, make more money in less time with less stress. And the one thing that it focuses on is a, a, a very large, but oftentimes ignored truth. Mm -hmm. Labor in, revenue out. Got it. Loan officers pour labor in mm -hmm. and they're not measuring revenue out. And I'm not suggesting it's about the money. What I'm suggesting is that everybody needs to understand that you can do everything or anything you're doing right now better than you're doing it. And if you do that and you pick the top three or four things you need to do really, really well, like a borrower consultation, sure. you got to have a black belt in that conversation right. if you want to see your conversion rate go up. Right. If you're like every other lender out there and you find out if they're employed and you find out what their credit score is and you find out how much money they have and how much they make and that becomes kind of the conversation, your conversion rate's going to remain low and it's going to be primarily rate driven. Yep. So what we do is we say, let's measure hourly rate. This is fascinating. <laughs> let's measure how many hours you work a day yep. and how much you made that day. And then let's take it down to by hour. And people are going, what do you mean by hour? Well, no, by hour. Because if, if I waste an hour where I can make 10 grand yep. and I make no grand, I got to fix that. Sure. Because if I fix that, then I make 10 grand and I work less hours. Right, right. What most people do is they work more hours. Yeah. And what we know about productivity, um, I'll give you one stat. Stanford uh, did a bunch of research and they found out that right around 55 hours a week, productivity comes to a screeching halt, even though you might work 56 hours or 57 hours and they go after 70 hours a week, mm -hmm. there's no benefit hmm. to the extra time invested. Yeah. So our deal is whoever said 
you have to work 40 hours. Right. Why don't you, what, what would happen Maybe if you- Maybe in a factory that was the thing, right? Because you could quantify what you well, were you doing, could, yeah. right? It was like a, put the lids on the thing. It was like this mindless work. But if you're, like you're saying, probably having to use your mind, you're having to do all this stuff, you probably have a burnout moment. Not only do you have burnout, but you have, and this is where most people really get impacted. I, I often, people, people oftentimes kind of have a conversation with me about like their success, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and I can always tell when it is built the right way or the wrong way. I can tell when it's built on sand or if it's built on this great foundation. And so when it's, when it's kind of fragmented and it just sounds a little bit disjointed, I'll say like, it doesn't sound like you've been in the business 20 years. It sounds like you've been in the business one year, 20 times. <laughs> and they, Interesting, yeah. they kind of go like this. And I, and I go, what would happen if you could do in five years what you have taken 20 to do? And then it goes all the way out and you look at, you know, guys and gals today that are in their fourth decade of doing loans and they're still not financially free. Yeah. So, so could, could a selling proposition be, why don't you do in a decade what the rest of the world takes for to do? Yeah. Is there anything wrong with that? And so I got a, I got a text the other day and this gal, Charlene in, in Salt Lake City, same gal that did the 125 realtor meeting that I was talking about early on but she said um she said um in one year i went from a 60 hour work week to a 30 hour work week and i went from 30 percent of my day selling to 75 percent of my day selling and i made an extra million dollars the first year Man. of doing that yeah I believe and it. so we 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 i are, are all of our coach faculty i mean nobody gets a plaque for working the most hours no there's no reward for like you go to a sales, you know, <laughs> celebration conference, president's club, chairman's club. Hey, we want to give Todd recognition. He worked more hours last year than <laughs> any other loan officer in the company. That's just not going to happen. No one's going to do that. Yeah. So, so our highest income earner right now, loan officer, not a business owner or anything like that, but our highest income earner right now is making $4,700 an hour Wow. and works 20 hours a week. That's great. So it's a big, it's delegation, it's building some pods, you know, and doing stuff like that. But um, you, you think about this and you think about what would happen if instead of making five grand a month, you can make five grand a day. And it's great, not, yeah. it's, there's no manipulation here. It's not like voodoo, drink this sauce or, no. you know, put this secret oil on or this, that, or the other. Say these in incantations. Yeah. Right, right. It's like, do the work and just figure out. What am I smarter, worth? not harder, right? What I, That's what, what it is. Yeah, but people, that, that has been so, said so much that people go, well, what does smarter mean? Well, here's smarter, right? Yeah. Okay, so if everything can be improved, which it can, right? Yep. There's probably four things we could do over right now on this podcast. It's still great, right? <laughs> no, but it's it, perfect. This no, been but great. <laughs> my point is everything can be improved. So if yeah. everything can be improved, how long does it take? a loan officer to have a sales conversation to get to yes. Mm. And let's just pick a number. Sure. Let's say it's a half hour. Yep. Okay. Half hour of going back and forth, having conversation, blah, 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 blah. You ready to go? Yeah. It feels good. Let's go. Well, right. what if, what if you could go, what if you could get, let's go in five minutes yeah. and people go, that's not realistic. I go, it's totally realistic. You just got to, you got to do it differently. And so then people go, pe people go like, yeah, they go, well, what's different? And I go, I go, how about this? How about understanding that most salespeople, real estate, lending, doesn't matter if it's retail, commercial, doesn't matter. Most salespeople talk too much. And you know why they talk too much? They're nervous. Yep. And you know why they're nervous? Because they don't know what they're doing. Right. And they just figure we'll follow the question process that we've been taught to follow, blah, 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 blah. So we, um, and everybody can download this. And all of your listeners can go to ToddDuncan.com, download resources, and, and, and click on Talk Less, Sell More. Talk love Less, that. Sell More. Is that a t-shirt? Yeah. Yeah, I it's a it. relationship <laughs> over transactions, Talk Less, Sell More, and then Trust Sells is our other t-shirt. Trust That's Sells, cool. that's a great word. Great combination of words. I think I heard a story when I first got in the mortgage business, the first trainer that I had said the best salesman he had ever met was a guy who actually had a speech problem and he just and he never he never really talked he just asked a couple questions and then he would say sign here that's all he would do is just say okay sign here and then they would just feel bad and they would sign and he was like 
this guy never overspoke, didn't like over explain things. Yeah. They just trusted him for some reason, the way he listened to them. And but yeah, I think people talk too much. They just probably because they're nervous or probably because they feel like that's what's necessary to get the sale. When I think that's the opposite is like you people want to be heard. They don't want to be talked at. And they'll ask you questions if they're interested in, in knowing more, right? They're right. not just going <clears> to, <throat> if you're just blabbing, then it's probably, you're probably going to, they're going to retain 10% of what you said, maybe, but they're mostly going to just remember how you made them feel, which is going to be, this guy talked too much. Yeah. I don't want to work with him. Yeah. I don't want to take his call because he's going to talk to me too much again on the phone. So they just avoid your call, right? Like, is that? Yeah, I, th- I think, and, and what's, I, what's really wild about that truth is that the more they feel they're losing control, the more they talk. Yeah. So about three seasons ago on Million Dollar Listing New York, okay. Ryan Serant and Tyler Whitman were going up for the same seller, same property, same price point, same everything. And Tyler Whitman's kind of new, and he's just blah, 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 right? Yeah. Ryan Serant at the, at, at the moment says, so let me ask you a question. What are you passionate about? And this guy happened to be an artist, and this house that he had happened to be like in a gallery, right? Yeah. And so by the time that he had answered the passion question, it was all about a canvas. It was all about Picasso. It was all about selling this piece of art home right. to the highest bidder and going and buying a new piece of canvas to paint the next painting, right? Yeah. So I started thinking, that's interesting. So then we started doing some research and we, and we took this talk list somewhere and we said, I wonder what would happen if you asked one question to get yes. Mm. So we started messing around with it. Mm-hmm. We got a client on the phone. This was one year ago in January. They had 200 loan officers. We taught them the talk list somewhere and there were six different question banks they could pull from. I'll use a first-time home buyer and the question bank would be fear because most first-time home buyers have fear. Mm-hmm. So I tell them what to do. Of, what are you afraid of? Or well, wait, wait. It gets yeah, it, yeah. kind of, but not. We don't like to use the word fear because it kind of endorses or says fear. Mm-hmm. But we can reinterpret that, right? Like, what about this is bothering you? Or, or, or since this is your first home, what scares you the most, and how can I take those fears away or take those things away from you? And then it got even better. So I'll give you an example. So we told people. I want you to have 10 conversations in the next 30 days with borrowers, come back and report in what happened. Mm-hmm. So this one guy, Portland, Oregon, gets a referral from Anchorage, husband and wife moving down to Portland, and they're first-time home buyers. Okay. So he gets them on Zoom, kind of gets everything going, and uh, he says, so the reason why Jackie referred you to Melody, my agent, is because we do things a little bit differently. And my goal is to figure out one thing and then show you how we can make that happen. And they go, what's the one thing? Hmm. And he goes, what would it mean to you guys to own a home? I said, what would it mean to you guys to own a home? Yeah, that evokes an emotion, right? Yeah. Has anybody ever heard in this podcast that people buy emotionally? <laughs> and yet 90% of loan officers don't even know how to evoke the, the emotion? Right. So listen to what happened. The, the wife started crying tearing up and tears coming down her face on zoom Mm. 10 seconds later the husband starts crying and tim the loan officer just lets it happen right which is the key when somebody's feeling emotion don't hand them a kleenex no right (laughs) let the tears flow right yeah and so um the husband said if we could own real estate we would be the first couple in the history of our family to have a home to own a home that's so cool so listen to this so all Tim said was, I'm going to make that happen. Are you ready to get started? And they said, yes. <laughs> so he took that maybe 30 minute conversation down to five minutes with, with emotion that locked him in forever. A hundred percent. Cause they made that happen. Yeah. That's, and in the next wow. 90 days, he got 13 more loans from <laughs> that couple. Cause they were moving the company down to Portland. Jeez. So, so the point is we don't have to talk too much. No. We got to get people talking. Yeah. And then just listen. And it's so powerful. So powerful. there's psychology in that, right? And, and I think it's, it's like taking time to master the craft of we're, we're salespeople, right? We're salesmen. We're saleswomen. If, if we don't take that time to master who we are and try to be better at what we mm. are and what we're doing, yeah. then what are we doing? 
right? We're just transaction order takers. We're working too hard, yeah. transaction and order AI takers. AI can take over like that. 100%. But if you can figure <laughs> out how to attach a feeling, and I try to do that with marketing all the time. I talk to Ryan, I'm like, like I want, when he shows me different pictures, I'm like, I don't feel something from this, or I feel this from that, or I feel that. Everything that you see with your eyes, it creates an emotion, whether it's good, bad, or nothing. And and so when we see like a good marketing piece, it's like, I want to feel something with that. Like with, with like home ownership, right? You usually have someone with a, a kitchen and a smiling couple and they're happy, right? So you're creating an emotion. Mm-hmm. Same thing with not just marketing and imagery, but with, with what you say with your words is is something that we can master, right? It's like, we got we to gotta work at that. We got to figure out how to do it. And you practice. I don't think... There's very few people that practice this stuff, right? Maybe your your group that you're coaching are practicing it, but I don't think you know most LOs I know they don't get up in the morning and look in the mirror and practice like how are they going to get better at their sales and how to shorten that pitch or yeah. create that emotion. Like, yeah, it's it's really interesting that um, anything that is very integratably important yeah. to what we do should be black belted it should be mastered yeah right so the sales conversation if you if you really think about this <clears throat> the sales conversation with a borrower should be mastered the follow-up with referral partners should be mastered and the customer experience should be mastered yeah. if all i do is focus on those three things mm-hmm. and i run the show that way and empower my team to deliver those things i'll never have to worry about revenue ever right but it's like how long would it take to perfect a sales conversation. I don't know, a week? Yeah. And then maybe a month of interactive experience. Yeah. How much better would you be at the end of a month if you reinvented your sales conversation? Right. Well, what would happen if you quadrupled revenue? Which you would because people are going to get to yes faster. Go back right. to the five minute conversation. How many more of those could I do in the next 25 minutes? Yeah. Five. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, if I get really good at stuff, and it's like when I was learning how to, to f- uh, fly private planes, it was it was really interesting because you know the taking off was no big deal, flying around was no big deal, navigation a little bit harder, but came came pretty easily. For me, it was landing, and it was like you know if That's you're going to be a pilot, part, yeah, if you're going to be a pilot, you got to land, right? You yeah. got to learn how to land. And so I remember the first couple landings. You know, it's just like you know you got your instructor next to you, he's got the yoke, and you're kind of doing it as you go down, and and then pretty soon he goes, it's your turn, and you're going, holy crap, you know, because I'm I'm like I don't know. <laughs> 500 feet off the runway and there's the runway and here's my first landing. And yeah, and I wasn't very good at it. Most pilots aren't, but I mean, yeah. you got to land. You, you got to be able to land. land. Yeah. At some point you got to land. You're going to run out of fuel. <clears> not. And so I came home one day and um, my wife looked at me and she goes, you look like you saw Jesus. And I go, I, I think <laughs> I did. And he goes, what? I said, I got cross, I got cross winded on the runway and I think I almost crashed. And she goes, well, you probably learned what not to do. Right. And just leave it to my wife, right? You learned what not to do. <laughs> she goes, you got you to do what you teach people, which is like, okay, so what was good about landing wrong? Yeah. Well, I figured out how to not land wrong. And right. so- um, Don't want to do know, that again. <laughs> 160 landings later, I'm finally certified to land. And, and now it's like second nature, but I had yeah. to train my butt off because yeah. it just didn't come naturally. And, and people and, don't train hard. And enough. it's apparent and obvious that you have to train <clears throat> for something like that, Right. right? For some reason, people think, oh, you're just either a natural at sales or you're just a natural at this. And you don't No, we all need to practice. It, it, we all need to learn how to bring that sale to an end or bring that landing in. Uh, I even think of it as like- That's a good like metaphor. Your no kid, landing in. <laughs> right? Like you, you talk to your kids and we go like, hey, how was your, your day, Nate? And they're like, oh, it's good. And then like later on, you're like, God, my kid doesn't want to talk to me or something. But if you could say like to your son, like, Hey, what would have made your day better? Or what what would it have meant to you if someone did this? Like that kind of interaction can change a whole uh like like someone told me one time, don't ask your kids like how their day was. Ask them like who made you laugh today or yeah. like something different, yeah. right? And so then like you bring out their thought process versus like they don't want to talk to you, but it all of a sudden brings that laugh like, oh, so and so made me laugh today. Mm. And then oh, what did they say? Or you, you can like so I, I say that to all, to say like we can get better at all things, right? And it's just something like like sales, like like what you're just talking about. Like I love that 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 quote you said at the end, which was you know what would it mean to you? I mean that is powerful. Yeah. yeah. Like, what would it mean to you guys if you could have a swimming pool in your backyard? Yeah. Yeah. You could tap into your equity without paying off that low rate first. Right. Oh, that'd be mean a lot. That means my summer, all the kids would be at our house. That means that. 
you know, our, we, we could we could hang out with our kids more, have barbecues, and you get them to sell themselves on why you should do that second, right? Or whatever, versus like, you know, oh, you don't have a low rate first, uh, or you, you don't have a, a lower rate than I have, sorry, bye, click. Yeah, which brings up an interesting point about today's market, and you and I were talking earlier, there's there's trillions of dollars in in tied up equity, right? Yeah. And it's just sitting there, waiting to be harvested, waiting to be capitalized, and there's a balancing act between security and and not taking on too much debt, and, and also improving real estate and and even invest in real estate if if we can borrow and then invest in you know in, in rehab Leverage, and, and yeah. do all that kind of stuff you know so so but the, one of the shifts people make today if they're going to be switched on mortgage professionals is they have to get into the equity game which yeah. is you know i mean you know that game very very well and if we don't know what people want to do to a house sure Okay. There's no there's no way to to even present a solution to them that would be valuable, which could be using a second and doing right. something like that. And I think the market. I've got one guy right now. This will blow your mind. He he decided that he wanted to build this this client for life model. We've taught it forever, right? Mm -hmm. And that is the keys not to get somebody to use you once. Yep. The keys to get them to use you all the time. And then in that process, tell everybody to use you, right? Right. So he started going after um, wealth managers and insurance professionals, uh, one of the largest insurance companies in America. And in three years, he took his database from 2,100 people to 30,000 people. Wow. And what they're doing right now is they're doing mortgage efficiency checkups, looking at both the debt, the, the mortgage, the payment, the equity – what we're doing with the equity and what's the next step, yep. which you and I were talking about earlier today, which is like, that's a market. Yeah. That right there is a market. And it's so surprising to me that loan officers don't call their clients that they helped finance real estate and ask them questions every, how you sing doing? every single year. How you like, doing, how are you Joe? doing? Yeah. How's the family? Yeah. You know, oh gosh, Sherry's pregnant with triplets oh really you bought a two-bedroom condo yeah you're gonna have four kids now what are you gonna do what are we gonna do yeah. what's next <laughs> yeah what's next and, and it's then just you, like you, you how would it feel if i could you know what would it mean to you if i could get you into a place da, 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 and keep yeah. your payments similar right right, right. right. Like, but it's that it's that kind of i don't i don't know why we sit here and we we go pound nails with our forehead right yeah. it's like that conversation should be natural yeah and listen to this so this and this it would be if you had a relationship, relationship. right <laughs> boom but, but you know what I, I i had a podcast what was was it last maybe last week and the guy was telling me how i think it was 90 percent of his loan officers they don't even take a 1003 anymore they just send out a link that was the number one way of building rapport that i had when i was trained in, as a loan officer like I asked them about their kids, their kids' sports. I took notes. You ask them all these questions in the 1003, you spend 30 minutes with them at least, and then you get these conversations going. You let them talk. You're asking them. They're talking. You're not talking. That is where you build that relationship. Right. That's the start, the foundation of that. Whereas like, what happened is everyone sent these links out, and then they're wondering why no follow-up, no no one wants to work, do business with you because you don't have you've never built that rapport. It's a, it, you know the 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 tech solution without trust does not work. Yeah, because it's not thought of as a solution. It's thought and of you're as not work. even trying to build trust. Yeah, the trust Just send is the link this, out and hope. Yeah. So 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 that's number one. You got to stop doing that, right? You got to go back to doing a regular, even a handwritten ten hundred three. Well, probably should type it because <laughs> <laughs> you got to upload it, and yeah, people's handwriting sucks now. But um, I wanted to get to the next thing was you were talking about being a black belt and things, right? So to me, that's like mastering something. How mm -hmm. do you master the art of following up? I know that's in one of your books too. Well, I, I think that anything is why am I doing it in the first place, right? Yeah. So, so I scratch my head when we have 45 questions that have been asked by almost, answered by almost 11,000 loan officers in a survey that we took six months last year to complete at the end of the year. 5% of the almost 11,000 loan officers say that they follow up with their borrowers after closing. 5%. 5%. That's nothing. Nothing. So 95% are one and done. That's a transaction. Okay? Yeah. That's a transaction. 4% have a concierge to <laughs> make the phone calls. 96% don't even have that. And then the question is like, do you get one more loan a year? For every borrower you successfully get financing for. Mm -hmm. What do you think the answer was? No. 
Nine percent. Nine percent say they do. Wow. And it's just like, so we scratch our heads and we go, so why follow up? Why? Why follow up? Yeah. Well, why follow up? It's the professional thing to do. And as a business owner, it's the smartest thing to do. Yeah. Acquisition, if and you don't have- It's the human thing to do. I mean, it's like- what's the, It's the right you thing. You spend all this time, 30, it's the right 30, thing to do. 30 days at least. With it's the, the right thing to do. And you just probably impacted their life tremendously. Yeah. yeah. And the reason why, like someone told me one time that, you know, it is so transactional and that buyers were- um, what was the word he used? It was like they were so. Um, it would he couldn't he, something about they they, were, they didn't they didn't give him any kind of like appreciation. Like there was no gratitude for what he did for them. And it was like, well, maybe you're not doing enough for that borrower to get the respect or get the gratitude, which is meaning you're just doing transactional stuff and you're just doing technology and you're not making that relationship become their friend and knowing you know, when their kids got their soccer game or what their favorite book was or whatever, right? You're just, you're not, you're not treating it like a, tra- you're not treating it like a relationship, you're treating it like a transaction. And, and so there and is no gratitude in a, in a transaction necessarily, right? Well, there's not. And it's, it's really, um, it's really diametrically opposed to the why anyway. So if you're helping people pursue the biggest dream of their life, which is to own a home, right? Okay, there ought to be massive emotion tied up in that. There ought to be massive gratitude. There, you should you should look at that borrower and say, you know, this is a dream come true for me. Yeah. I wake up every day so that it, something like this can happen. Right. And I want you to know for the next 30 years that my team and I are going to take care of your mortgage needs. Anytime cool. you know you need anything, yeah. we're going to call you once a year. This first year, we're going to follow up with you seven days after closing, make sure you're good with everything. We're going to yeah. do a... A 30 day follow up and then a six month and then every year thereafter we'll talk once a year and make sure the mortgage is working for you instead of you working for it that's gratitude right yeah. appreciation yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example we've gotten really bad at sending out thank you gifts we don't not send them out we just send out thank you gifts that don't really matter sure right they get consumed a bottle of wine great fine yeah. you know a, a, no thought a one, went into yeah it, it's yeah. just like send it send it send it send it um i did a presentation at sales mastery last year and it was like thank make your thank you gifts last a lifetime mm. and so i'm wearing this watch right now and uh i didn't pay for this watch but one of my clients was in st thomas and um knew that i loved watches knew that i loved bright leans and knew that there was only 100 of these watches in the world and so he's leaving the island he goes by the jewelry store he finds the watch, he buys two, <laughs> one for him and one for me. And I got back and he gave me this watch. And every time I have this watch on, I think of him. Yeah. And what's even more significant is he was one of the first guys killed in the Las Vegas massacre. God, and wow. so I, every time I look at this, I think of my friend that gave me this watch, but I think of my friend that died way too young. And at his service, his son came up with the watch on mm. and we took a picture of each of us having this watch. Wow. That that watch is going to remind me of Brian for the rest of my life. Yeah. And I tell people to pay attention to what people need, you know, don't give them crap. Right. Don't give them stuff that they're going to throw away. Don't give them stuff that is just like <sighs> that it's just like it's they'll stupid. never remember you from it. I mean they they'll consume that bottle of wine. Sure it was nice that you even did something. Yeah, but, but that wine is going to be gone and they're never going to Two days later they're yeah. going to forget the wine. Yeah, and they might even you know? be mad cuz they have a hangover the next right. day. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or they don't like red and they like white or whatever. Exactly. But my my point is if you can be if you understand relationship. Yeah. You'll send out different thank you gifts. Sure. You know, if you don't understand relationship, then it's one size fits all. Right. And I think we make a mistake there because think about marketing. Marketing is two things. Marketing is what other people say about you. Mm -hmm. And marketing is impression. Right. The most valuable impression you can make is something that matters. Yep. Okay. And so I have a CEO that goes, the market really is weird right now. I wish I had a crystal ball. Yeah. So I tell my assistant, go buy a crystal ball, <clears throat> get a sterling you know, silver uh, base to put that on, or send it out to Melissa. Now it's on her desk, and every time she yeah. sees the crystal ball, she thinks, <laughs> she thinks of me. Yeah. I think, you know, I think part of that is also just being kind of present and, and being alert. Like, I have this problem, and yeah. um, my wife is like, listen more, right? Like, she wants to, I just told you that yesterday, right? I'm like, well, I was, you know, thinking of 300 different other ideas I need to do. But um, if you're present and you are listening to that customer, because that's, that's right then, that's what's building that relationship, is that being that pre- present and listening, and then taking notes and then trying to remember, like, 
yeah, I mean, whatever it could be, right? There's always going to be something different, and you can pick up on it, get your little antenna up, and maybe it's something. It doesn't have to be expensive, right? I mean, that's I'm sure that's an expensive watch, but you know, maybe someone, uh, you know, someone commented on my shoes the other day. They're like, "I love those shoes. Those are cool." Like, you don't tie them. I'm like, "Yeah, I don't tie shoes anymore. I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> almost fifty. I don't want to tie shoes anymore. I just either flip flops or these slip ons." And I mean, this hundred bucks, I could probably get you know them a pair of those shoes because yeah. they really liked them. Right. That would have been some perfect gift, right, for for someone like that. And then every time they put those shoes on every day, they think of me and they're, I'm there. One hundred percent. Yeah. One hundred percent. And I think genius. the thing I love that you just said is, um, I don't want anybody to think that any part of our conversation is anything other than being present. Yeah. You know, it is the the number one thing for everything is deepening the relationship. Yeah. And I can't deepen a relationship if I'm not present. And yeah. I can't deepen it if I make it about me. Yeah. It has to be about you. True. And, and, and if I can show you through a different state of presence that I care. Yeah. And I ask you just a few questions about how you're doing and if you could change anything about the next 90 days to a year, what would it be in your position? And I love those questions. Like where, that. where can you find more joy and how can I help with that? And you know, I mean, joy and happiness, joy is inside, happiness is outside. People people do too much pursuing happiness yeah. without figuring out joy. Yeah. And so I think that one of the big deals in what we believe in is if you can connect here, mm -hmm. the inside game, yeah. the outside stuff's easy. Right. But if you don't get to the inside, the outside stuff's hard. You know, it's hard to remember sometimes is all these little, like these little questions like, uh, are, you know, it, it, like, do you have a list of questions that can trigger those conversations, like mm -hmm. open-ended questions in any of your books or like on your website? In, in the Power to Be Your Best, I have a questionnaire. Um, in our elite group, I have a question. I can send it to you and digitally if you want to because get it like, out there. Because like, I think the thing is, if you, if you know, let's say you just have like five questions, like the <clears> first <throat> one you said, like, what would it mean to you, right? Those, those kind of things. Sometimes it's just those things don't pop into your head when you're in a conversation. But if you can pull from, say, like that arsenal of like those, like maybe there's five, ten questions like that, then you could easily shift a shallow conversation into a real deep conversation that means something and lasts. Right? One of the great questions is, is help me understand what's important about success to you. You know, what are you really looking yeah. for and what do you really, really want to achieve? Um, that's an important question. Um, I love this question. If you could shake your entire business upside down and inside out, what are three things you never want to do again and why? Mm. And then I love the question, what makes you cry? Mm. You know, what makes you cry? I mean, where do you get the most joy yeah. in life, you know? And when you start having those questions, I put 35 people that were millionaires on a beach and I gave them a questionnaire. And I said, you guys have to spend 90 minutes answering these 12 questions. <laughs> and it was like, it was that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. It was like, wow. Because everybody's pursuing this. <clears throat> when you stop people long enough to figure out, like, like, like I look right now, my boys are 26 and 24. And, um, you know, part of the conversation right now is what do I want to do with them before it's too late? Mm. And I got a lot of years ahead of me, but it's like, right. what do I want to do with them before it's too late? I also did something about five years ago. Um, I wrote a one-page document. It was called, What Do I Want My Boys to Say About Me After I'm Gone? Ooh, that's good. And it's packaged up. It's in their treasure chest. I have a, two <laughs> boxes for them that uh, they open when I pass away, whenever that is, 50 years, I don't know, 40 years, whatever. It's like, it's the real stuff. Yeah. It's the real stuff that life's made of. That's what cool are you afraid of? Well, yeah. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? of? How yeah. can I help? Because that opens up vulnerability. And then, then that, relation, that, that interaction with that person just mm. became deep versus shallow. And it became memorable. Yeah. Too, right? And that's the, that's the thing that... <clears throat> who said that my angelo people will always remember how you made them feel right they won't remember what you did or said or said yeah. but they'll remember how you made them feel absolutely and i love that what's the circle of cash flow it's probably the biggest no-brainer on the planet okay in terms of expanding your biggest your business <clears throat> there's one question who do i know who knows who I need to know? Hmm. Who do I know who knows who, who I, I need, need to know? know. And yeah, it gets yeah. down to, you know, yeah. it gets down to Bob Bodine, Bodine, a friend of mine wrote a book called 
um, The Power of Who. And I like the title, but I like the subtitle. The subtitle is You Already Know Everybody You Need to Know. Interesting. And what he does is he builds a point, and this is, this is just pure truth. Why is it that we will prospect and prospect and prospect and prospect? Why is it not that we retain, we retain, we retain, we retain? Yeah. So, you know, we, we ask a question at application, like, how do you feel today? Mm -hmm. This is all done, right? How do you feel? Are all your questions answered? Yep. Okay. Are you confident going forward? Have we removed any fear? And if all those are yes, then, then the next thing is, that's great. We spend 90% of our time making sure every loan that we're processing goes through without any interruption, any surprises, and any pain. The only way we can afford to do that is if people like you that we've answered questions for and that are happy can help us find people that you might know that we could do the same thing for. Yep. So somewhere between now and the time that you move into your home, we'd just be honored. You know, we'd be honored to be able to have a conversation with anybody that you know. And you plant the seed and then it's like, okay, how do we get strategic about that? So let's say seven days in, somebody on the team talks to the borrower and asks the borrower, how are we doing for you? Yep. And the borrower goes, fantastic. Everything's great. Awesome. Good, good. Trigger. Yeah. So who do you know that might need this same experience either now? Because I'm sure you're talking to people about the home you're buying. Yeah, that's, you know, the, that's the time they talk about boom, 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 most, boom, boom, right? right? And, and then it gets down even deeper. So it gets down to like, okay, so if this is Mr. and Mrs. Johnson and, and we have a great relationship with Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, let's say Mr. Johnson is not Mr. Johnson, but he's Dr. Johnson. Yep. And let's say that he is the administrator of the California Medical Association. And mm -hmm. let's say that we blow his mind and he could actually help us find other physicians within a 25,000 person association. Right. Right. Yeah. But it all started with him telling me, you guys cranked it. You yeah. guys did great. Because you checked in with him. And, well, and he, and, but yeah. we, why, why is it that we don't do that? Because if I look at like, if, right. I'm, if I'm buying a home, I got a builder or a listing agent, I got a seller, I got a bank or a credit union, I probably have an estate planner, probably have a financial plan, probably have tax CPA. returns. Yeah. You have the circle <laughs> right there. <laughs> That's the On circle. On every loan, you've got at least <laughs> six other people. Easy. That could give you a ton yeah. of business. Yeah. Yeah. So, so picture this. If remember, remember the conversation with Denise who went from seven million to two hundred twenty-one million. Yeah. <clears throat> Imagine a financial planner having three hundred clients. Imagine calling every financial planner on every loan. Yeah. Imagine all of a sudden having a universe of thirty thousand financial Potential. planning clients. Yeah. This. Why would we not do that? Because and then you just prospect, 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 <laughs> which is the harder. That's actually the harder thing to do versus strategic, you know, knowing these things and saying, that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna well, do and the thing that. about this is I call you and say, hey, your buddy Bob asked me to give you a call, John. And, you know, bottom line is we did a great job for him and he yeah. told me you're buying a home and we want to do a great job for you. It's, you're yeah. not going to go, well, what's your rate? Right. You're going to go, I love Bob. I trust him. Mm -hmm. Let's talk. And that <laughs> CPA works for Bob. Right. Because he's the client. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so they're going to be, oh, yeah, what did Bob, yeah, what, talk, talk to me about Bob's situation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and how exactly. You, and but, I think, too, as a mortgage professional, we have to be educating these CPAs on what products are out, like the non-QM space, to. right? Like, I remember sitting down with a CPA one day, and I told him that we had a bank statement loan product. He said, wait, what? And I go, yeah, we don't need tax returns or WTs. We don't need any of that. <laughs> He's like, oh, wait, you mean you just check for deposits? Yeah. Oh, I know some people that could buy a house, you know, and they just were, they didn't know. So if you, if we're not doing those, you know, you could even do a seminar, like have like all the CPAs of your customers show up, you give them lunch and learn, teach them about these products. You know, wh wh why not? Why not do that? Right. I did a seminar in San Diego three years ago for one of our elite members to 21 accountants. Boom. He got him in a high rise, right? Three buildings away from here. Yeah. Put him around the conference table and we talked, if you can believe it, we talked to CPAs about um, the customer experience and referrals. Yeah. And wow. it's like, you know, most CPAs aren't thinking customer no. service. No. They're just thinking, and Numbers. it was just like, <laughs> and my, my point though to everybody on that question, like, is you already know who you need to know. It's sad to me to see how much effort we give to trying to, to do business. Right. And then we think it's like, somebody said the other day, like you're, you know, 
you wake up on the first of every month and it's time to go hunt again. And I just vehemently disagree with that philosophy. Right. You, you should, in your career, you should hunt less and harvest more. Yeah. And the people that don't harvest more haven't focused in on less. Right. And so they, they get a whole new slew of buyers the next month instead of referrals. And then the next month after that. And yeah. the next month after that. They're killing the golden goose every, every One, time. They're not even, they don't even know there's a goose and a golden egg. <laughs> That's so they don't even know that. And yeah. it's like... I don't know. I don't know. I mean, um, I did loans for the California Airline Pilots Association. Is that? Did you do that because you were trying to be a pilot? Or no, you... no. I financed a loan for a pilot. And you're like, oh, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of people here. There's like 3,700 <laughs> pilots in California yeah. that are part of this association. And so he started referring. Pilots are really well qualified. Yeah. <clears throat> Commercial pilots have good income. They have steady income. They don't get laid off. They They're don't get- kind of savers, right? right? Like they save. Right. Yeah, they and got a pension. Like, they got, uh, they they got, got everything. Probably got a nice 401k or whatever too, you know? Yeah, so it's- a, and, and I even had a great relationship with a jewel, uh, jewelry store. Like imagine being the lender for people coming in shopping for engagement rings mm -hmm. because they're going to get married and buy a home. Man. And you're in a mall- yeah. Like in Westminster, California, and you right. get like 200,000 people a week that come through and see your jewelry store. They just got engaged. They're probably going to be looking for a house. Right. <laughs> and then, by the way, you do first-time homebuyer seminars, and then you refer the jeweler. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, so if you're listening to this podcast and you don't know Todd Duncan, which I would be surprised if you don't, you need to be learning stuff from them. I mean, you got, you got videos on YouTube. You've got books. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it, at this point, it's people. If, if people aren't, you know, crushing it right now, which a lot of people are not, mm -hmm. then they need to take some time, maybe an hour a day. That's it, right? You're going to spend time on TikTok or on on uh, some social media channel and you're going to spend an hour, <laughs> a waste away your hour where you can go learn learn stuff like this or listen to, I mean, you're listening to a podcast, so obviously, so you're trying, but, you know, reach out to Todd and and get uh, get some more advice, get some get some good tips on the, on the YouTube stuff and the books. I mean, I, I think we can all get better especially during this time we have more time. We're not, you know, most people I think in the mortgage business aren't just inundated with calls all day long, mm, right? So no. there's this is the time Crickets. when we can be coming a brown belt, a black belt, <clears throat> you know, a, at our craft to to better who we are so then we can keep improving. Going from let's say like today is a 7 million, right? And then we want to go to that 200 million that you were talking about. How do you do that? Well, there's ways you can do that. It's part, partly it's becoming better at your craft. And better. you know, it's it's really important to remind everybody it's not by it's not doing more. Yeah, it's doing less things better. Yeah. And so you know, if you go to toddduncan.com, you can download the the uh, talk less some more white paper. You can also download the high trust interview guide. Yeah. And it's a it's a 16 page white paper that teaches how to have the relationship conversation, no strings attached, completely free. Just download them practice that because if this works yep. the volume takes care of itself absolutely if this doesn't work there's nothing you can do to make this work no. if i don't like you and you don't like me <laughs> we're not doing business together but if we have chemistry and we yeah. like each other then we can do we can make big things happen absolutely. and my advice to everybody would be focus in on value less is best more value more yeah. loyalty loyal loyalty is a two-way street yeah i gotta give it to get it i yeah. can't demand it and like to your point of less talk, more selling, like yeah. I think people do that in emails, right? Like they do it in, I, I could I could go into my LinkedIn page right now and see all the people that are hitting me up on LinkedIn. And I tell you, they are <laughs> just blabbing on their pitch. Yep. And it's like, delete, 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 delete. delete, delete. Why, why is that happening? They haven't obviously read your books. <laughs> no, they don't. They, it's all, it's all, uh, it's all like a dragnet. It's like, put the net out. And see what you catch. There's no intention behind it. Yeah, I can't believe how many um, emails and and on my LinkedIn, I can't believe how many people think they're my friend. Yeah, and they're just pitching me. It's just like ridiculous. And they you give know, you like 13 bullet points, and they give you this whole thing, and then you're just like, this is yeah, this is like a robot could have sent this to me. This is crazy, not, not good. Crazy. Um, kind of to the point of like we were talking earlier, people feel like they're working twice as hard for half the money. Where with your system, you can work half, half as hard the time and twice the twice money. The revenue yeah so i think now more than ever it's it's very very vital to to start implementing stuff like this right? i had a loan officer that sent me his bank deposit last month and he deposited three hundred forty thousand dollars in commissions and it's 2023 and we're in a bad market yeah not to him <laughs> he's not having a bad market <laughs> and, the, and i think the point to everybody is the economic universe yeah 
is doesn't not have a bias. Right. It's not going to say, well, emotionally, I don't like that person, so I'm not going to provide income and revenue to that person. Right. It's out there. Yeah. You just have to decide, you know, how good do you want to be? Who do you want to be good to? Mm -hmm. And then how do you nurture that? Yep. Nurturing that relationship will bring you so much joy, so much business that's easy business. Yeah. Talk about high conversion. We got one guy right now that his prequal to loan funded rate is 89%. Think about that. One of my brokers. I'd one love to have him send yeah. fund loans business because yeah. our, our conversion ratio is, is much lower than that. Yeah. Well, it's, the industry's low. It's like 19%. Yeah. So it's, what it's if you just amazing. got better? What To your point, what if you just got better at conversion by 2% a month for six months? Right. Do you know the stats on this? So if you if you make, if you want to make $350,000 and your commission is 110 basis points and your average loan amount's $440,000 and you have a 19% prequal to app, with an 85% pull through, you'll make $36,000 a month. If you take that conversion rate from 19% up 12%, so it'd be what, 30, 31? Mm -hmm. You'll make an extra $21,000 a month. You Jeez. don't have to work any harder. Just you just better. have to get more people to say yes. Not by mm. selling more, right? but by talking less. Talking less. Yeah. And all of a sudden there's a quarter of a million dollar raise for every loan officer in America. Yeah. If you add 12% conversion effective. So I would focus on that. Gosh, Todd, you make it sound so easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you focus on one skill set for like four or five months, you'll have it figured out. And and this is the thing is, do you, do you know John Bianchi? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I, I worked for him for a minute, like literally for uh, <laughs> back in, I don't even know what year it was, probably 99, something like that. Uh, and he gave away all his ideas. And I remember sitting there going, man, he's got a lot of good ideas. I go... And I, and I pull him aside. Uh, he, he was going to give me my business cards because I was going to work for him, right? And I'm like, you're giving away all your ideas. He's like, yeah, no one's going to do them. He's like, I, he's like and, and they're not going to outwork me. And I was like, and I just kind of had this like this like epiphany of he's right. Like, And, and guess what? Maybe one person will do 20% of what he's doing mm. and they'll pick up on some ideas and it'll help him because he was the branch manager right. and all that the, at right. the uh, North American or something. Where right, right. Yeah. North and, American and Mortgage. I was just like, I can't believe that, you know, and we're giving away, you're giving away your secrets and these ideas. We always do that on the podcast. We give away ideas on how to get more origination and people listen. And I, I'm sure there are people here listening that are going to do it. Right. But what is it about that thing that people need to do to get to the next level of doing it? Like what, how do they go from listening and going, yeah, that's a great idea to I'm going to actually implement this, implement this. Yeah. Is it, is it like, does it take a, a paradigm shift? Does it take like a, some like life experience change? Like were you going to get divorced because your wife's going to leave you because you don't have any, no, any money? Or is it like a wake up call where you like, like now you're going to turn it on the switch? Like how do people do that? that that's like, I think the billion dollar question is, you have all the tools, you have all the ideas, you have all this stuff, the books, endless books, endless podcasts out there on how to be successful, you know, the Tony Robbins seminars, all these things, right? But like, where do you go or how do you get that where you can flip the switch on? Is it takes, what does it take? Is uh, it's, uh, you know, it's the spark. Um, the the answer in my mind is is pretty straightforward and sadly it's overused and and you know there's you you type into Google you know how do I discover my why and there's like 500 billion responses right yeah and so everybody's trying to figure out what is that motivation so I just tell people what when how and why and why is the last because mm. whatever it is what do you want what do you want when when will you have it. it? How will you get it? Yeah. And why? So if I know right now. That's like a, like a little um, exercise that everyone should stop and do right 100%. now. 100%. So like stop this podcast. Yeah. Write down what do I want? What do I want? When will I have it? Or when How you will think I you get can, it? No, no. When will I have it? Oh, you like, have to, you have pick to, yes. the date. Yeah. Pick I want it by like, this date. Yeah, by this date. Because if you don't pick the date, you won't have the the discipline to drive to that destiny. Yeah, I'm I'm only a speaker because somebody looked me in the eyes in a seminar with two thousand people, and he said, "When are you going to be a speaker?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "I'm not sure. I just decided that I wanted to do it." And he says, "Pick a date." And I go, "I will." And he goes, "Pick it now." And I go, "Right this minute." He goes, "Yeah, pick it now. Otherwise, you won't have the discipline to drive right. to that destiny." So I picked July sixth, and it was January. Yeah. And he said, he said, if you don't call me by this date to tell me you're a professional speaker, I'm going to call you and ask you why you didn't hold to this. 
Yeah. But but so for me it was like um I it's already know when it, it's what when, when how why. And you can write down how. I'm going to do it because this is this this is this, this. Yeah. This is what I'm yeah, going to yeah. do and you then you probably just start going yeah. deep into that. But and but the, the thing that's important is self accountability. Yeah. can only be achieved if you know your purpose, which is your why. Yeah. Like, like I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this because my wife said, if you don't figure this out, we're divorcing. Right. You may get that ultimatum. Okay, sure. so two people want to make it work, right? And yeah. if you keep making promises and you keep breaking the promises and you say you'll be home at four and you come home at eight, right. pretty soon somebody's going to have enough of that, right? Right. Is it savable? Yeah. Is it better to not have it happen? Yeah. Yep. So, so I got to pay attention to the details but any tectonic shift, anything I want to start doing tomorrow, anybody listening to this yep. has to stop and go, what do I want? When, when do I want it? How am I going to get it? And why? why? Give me an example of a why. Um, okay, so I wanna, I'm, I wanted, yeah, go ahead. I'm making a massive investment right now to add a technology vertical to my company. And the why behind it is impact. The only reason back. I'm investing and the only reason we're doing this is I can't physically get to all the people I want to impact. Yep. So the technology solution that we're creating is going to imp impact people around the globe. Mill great. Millions of people. That's great. And I'm doing it because I would like to wake up and I'd like to know that whether I go on a jet and go speak or go to the office and do a what I'd like to be able to know that without me even doing anything, millions of people are getting impacted. That's my why. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that's right now. This, in fact, and I'm leaving this small, to talk with right? my technology why partner. Why can be like, because I want to have more time with my kids. And, which time, is a but huge time thing. equals freedom. Right. Freedom's a bigger why than time. Yeah. Freedom. And what about freedom? Well, freedom would mean maybe I'm able to spend time so I don't have regret. Yeah. What would it look like if you didn't have regret? I'd be super happy. What would it mean to you yeah, if you didn't with, have regret? Yeah. Right? Like, and we'll all have, we all have regrets, but yeah. many of them could be minimized. Right. My wife and I, every Sunday night, we have a debrief. It starts out like, hey, honey, would you like to know what you did well this week? <laughs> yeah. And so Deb will go for 20 minutes do and tell me. Do you write everything. down so you know, or do you just, she just, you just go, We just go from memory. Memory. We just the highlights, right, of the whole week. That's cool. And at the end of that, then I do it with, to her, you know, and then, yeah. um, and then the, it's like, is there one thing I can do better? Nope. Just keep loving me like this. You know, is yeah. there anything I can do better? <sighs> You've interrupted me a couple times. <laughs> I know that's your style, but please just try to listen to me a little bit more deeply on something. Okay, baby, I'll do that. Yeah. But, you know, we're never going to crash right. because we're doing these check-ins every seven days. Well, loan officers should be checking in with their clients every seven if days. If they want a relationship. <laughs> they right. want more business. You want to stay married? If they want to crush it in 23, <laughs> right. you have to do this, right? Yeah, yeah. So that to me is, yeah, what do you want? When are you going to have it? How are you going to get it? And why? So I, I'm a big believer in the dream boards. The, Love it. You know, all that stuff. Love it. And, and before when i did my first dream board which it worked but when i did it i didn't ever put a time on things right so the last one i did i was right you know i write down like what time like by this date by this you know but i love the whole like how you know you can you can take it deeper right so you have mm -hmm. your dream board the visualization is great but then maybe have a second one or that you have your own little journal or something it's like I have my dream board and this is when I'm going to have these things by, mm -hmm. and this is how mm -hmm. I'm going to have these things. And then this is yeah. right. Like the why, cause I, I, not cause I want a Ferrari. I'm not, want, I don't want a Ferrari. It's not on my dream board, but if you had that on your thing, you'd say, I want a Ferrari because why not? Or because I, you know, I love fa going fast. Well, it's, it, it, it makes it, you know, if I have a Ferrari, it, it makes me feel accomplished sure. because I have the resources to do that right. rather than going in debt and, you know, Buying, buying it, at, buying it, and saying, "Look at this, this is my new business card." I you just know, loved a, Magnum PI when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm gonna relive my childhood and buy a Amen. red for <laughs> Amen. Seventy six, three hundred eight, GTB, baby. <laughs> um, so what? Uh, I know we're running out of time, but um, what? Uh, what are? What do you think right now? Is some missed opportunities in the mortgage industry. I think the the biggest missed opportunity is everybody that is scared is not hunting. Yeah. And and I think this is a ripe time to get after it. You know, you yeah. use the word when we were texting yesterday, you use the word hustle. Yeah. And and I think right now it is seed planting time. And I want to remind everybody that 
you know, the, the acres of diamonds means there's plenty of business right now. It's just under your feet. You got to find it. Right. And today is seed planting. Because if we look at 2024 and 25, I just did something this morning with all the um, MBA statistics. We're going to be in a great market. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the, the consumer price index is going to be down around two, which means spending powers through the roof. Uh, 30 year fixed interest rates are going to be around four. Um, we're going to we're going to have about five and a half million homes that need financing. What's negative about that? Right. You know, um, Fed funds rates going to drop to two, two and five eighths or two and a half, you yeah. know, by 2024. Um, there's nothing to be negative about. Yeah. But in 2025, if you don't act right now in 2023. Yeah. You're okay. Your 2025 is going to be, you're not going to get as much. And it's going to be harder. Well, Way harder if you're not putting in the time now, right? Well, and, and by the way, 2025 will be tomorrow's refis based on what you do today. Yeah. And we got to get people off the fence. 7% is not a bad rate. No. And that's why I love seconds because <laughs> when you do the seconds, yeah. then you can consolidate right, them right. back into a new first in 2025. Um, then you got two transactions. See? And you might even get them cash out so that you can, they can go buy a house right now. And then you make a, another relationship with a CPA, a realtor. Think a about how many planner. people need the one statement equity line exactly boom you yep. know think about how many cpas clients want to but they, like so many loan officers <laughs> are like i don't want to do it all that work for one you know two grand or fifteen hundred dollars but it's a pass off it's it's you're building a relationship <laughs> for 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 get, you're getting paid to build a relationship oh, but why not right? crazy yeah crazy um what about shout outs anybody um i know you mentioned a couple people but anyone that really kind of helped you along uh, in your career you know, that you, that you just want to shout out to? Yeah. So I, I think, um, first of all, John Maxwell, um, you know, a great friend of mine taught me leadership at, at the best level possible. And I think I've become um, a, a really good leader because of that. Yeah. Um, I love the the idea of originally I had a, um, a mentorship with Mike Vance, who was Walt Disney's creative guy. And so then I, I, I fast Does forward. Does he have an accent? Uh, he does not. Okay, I, he, I just I just was at a seminar he, with a guy that's a creative, but yeah. he wasn't. He's was probably more of a recent one. Is this? Was Mike this was nineteen sixty. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. He died about five years ago. But but creative thinking, right? And so you you look at Seth Godin, you look at a lot of these these guys mm-hmm. that are talking about disruption and things like that. I also think that the the book I just read by uh, by Robert Schaefer, um, Marketing Rebellion. Uh, his tagline on the book is "The most human company wins." And I like that. I like the most human loan officer wins. Yeah. He who is good. the most human is going to win the high finance deals. Um, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So those are, those are important. Um, in, in, a, in a time of AI, right, with the chat GPT just came out, everyone's talking about it. We, want, we need to be more human. 100%. Less, less chat GPT, more human. 100%. This AI is like diverging. It's like back to the whole thing we talked about this, this whole podcast. It was like, how do we become more human, right, with our customers and create those relationships? It's interesting that it's interesting to try to trust technology that doesn't have a heart. Yeah. And the higher the transaction value, the more the heart is needed. Yep. And yeah. and the problem with our industry is we do too much head stuff. Right. Lots of fee sheets, lots of rate quotes, lots right. of time promises. We forget lots of t- about the emotion that's in there, right? And yeah. that's what you pull yeah. out of. I yeah. love that story you told about the the uh, the husband and wife they, they just let them cry on the yeah. on the Zoom. Let them tears yeah. come. Let them go. That's a good just thing. Stop. That's a good thing. I'll even say to people when I see tears in a one on one, I'll go, "What's behind the tears?" Mm. And they'll start crying more. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like we're a therapist when you're a loan officer. It's almost like you're a little bit of a therapist, a little bit. Um, you're obviously an educator. You're a you're a um, coach. You're you're a you know, all the things, right? All these different like hats that we have to wear to really be successful at what we're doing. And I mean, you know, never stop learning, right? Never stop trying to grow your, your, your sales skills. We're salespeople. Let's grow those sales skills. How do people find you, Todd? Um, they want to reach out. Work I with think you. the, all my social handles are at Todd Duncan official. Um, so IG, LinkedIn, um, TikTok, that kind of stuff. And then uh, toddduncan.com is where all the free resources are. That's cool. Just sign and up. Then and then you sign up for your email alerts. I just saw that one that you did with uh, the YouTube. And it was great. Yeah. I know you walked over a building. I was yeah. like, he's tall, but I didn't know he's that tall. <laughs> yeah, these guys are just amazing. I, have a, I, have, I got, I don't know, seven or eight guys that are, guys and gals that are on my creative team. And it's just like, all right. I got mentored. Now I am a mentor. <laughs> That's cool. That's so cool, man. Yeah. Thank well, you, man, you, for this time. Yeah. It was beautiful. Appreciate you coming on. It yeah. really, really means yeah. a lot that you made the effort to come down here and, and share with our audience. And 
You know, I, I'm a big believer in you ever since I first saw you. I think I saw you at a, a countrywide event and you were speaking or something many, many <laughs> that years ago. Was that a Bianchi there? Yes, yes. It was, it was, uh, I was like, that guy's great. And, yeah. and then, you know, obviously he came on the Mortgage Minute, like by 2018, so like many years back. And then, you know, um, I'm a big, you know, believer seeing what you're doing is, is, is impacting. Let's do more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah let's do more. It's fun. Stuff. I wake up for this stuff. Yeah. So thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. Please like, share, subscribe, comment. You know, I keep saying that till I'm blue in the face, but I know at some point you will. Uh, love uh, that we had Todd on here. Go reach out to him. Check out his books. And I'll see you on the next podcast. The Million Dollar Mortgage Experience Podcast.